Hey, Joe and Amy, if you would, Doc, um, go ahead and uh, let us know, you know, get rid of your background. They already know it, but let's go ahead and put it out there. Well, I'm a actively licensed, um, board certified medical doctor in uh, the field of OBGYN, also a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. And uh, we've been in practice, gosh, since uh, I, I became a doctor in 1980. So I've been a pra- in practice 44 years, you know, although at pretty much we're I'm, we're not seeing patients anymore. We're now we're just writing about situations like survival scenarios and things that uh, might hit people. We we call our uh, website Doom and Bloom because uh, Doom represents all the disasters that can occur in the world, and Bloom is the human resilience in the face of adversity. And uh, so we we write in plain English for people, and our mission is to make a basically. Put a medically prepared person in every family. That's right. I am a nurse practitioner. I graduated from a all women's Catholic college, Barry University in 87. So I was an RN for a few years. Went back to school, knew I wanted to be a nurse midwife, nurse practitioner. And uh, University of Miami graduate and uh, then met him. <laughs> we decided we really that was your first mistake. didn't want to do the <laughs> delivery, you know, working 80 to 100 hours a week. So figured something else out yeah. and um, wound up researching and becoming serious uh, preparedness folk and thinking, you know, there's really not anyone who's written these kind of mm-hmm. of scenarios about these kind of scenarios before and just writing some articles here and there and and the articles people would write back to us and say listen i'm printing all your articles and trying to organize it but it would be so much more helpful if you would write a book and we were like (laughs) a book okay and so we stumbled into writing the first edition which turned into the second edition which turned into the third edition and then the pandemic hit we ripped the third edition apart spread it all out on the floor and said, okay, now we just need to rewrite everything. (laughs) So we just went chapter to chapter, added a lot more stuff because he had been writing for so many years in between the third edition and the fourth edition. Added all that in. Went from like 13 chapters to 36. Yeah. So that. Reorganized everything. Uh, Like I said, we just went through chapter by chapter. That, That was our pandemic project so i feel like we at least accomplished something we had to make it an an eight by ten uh make the font a little bit smaller and then take away all the spaces in the paragraphs (laughs) and the margins are about a quarter of an inch if nobody's happy about printing it but i say you can do it just put it on paper it'll work wow (laughs) it's uh, it's a labor of love yeah now did you um tear it apart and go through it when, when the lockdowns hit just because you wanted something to do and work on it? Or was that the co was it COVID initiated is like, I need to put some yeah, more information had, out. Well, I, okay. So I don't know. I'm not sure because January, 2020 it hit mm-hmm. and September, early September, I came into the room and I saw him ripping the book apart. And I was like, I knew immediately what he was doing this for. And I was like, no, because Every time we do one of these books, it takes a minimum of one year, 365 days, morning, noon, and night, get coffee, start writing, no vacations, no time off, just write, 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 write. So I knew at that moment that a year of work was in front of me and I just went, okay, well, there's nothing else for us to do, so let's do it. But it was his idea to do the fourth edition. So speaking of preparedness, um, what did you did you start off did both of you start off in the preparedness mindset did that something happen after you met and uh, well as south floridians we've always been hurricane preppers yes. you know and okay uh, that, means, that means that we've always had a couple of weeks supply instead of three days supply right. of food in the pantry in case a storm knocks the power out right uh, batteries flashlights right. um blankets tent um we even had at one point i think a little uh blow up canoe (laughs) because there's a lot of water where we are um you know canned goods you know all 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 the stuff that you would expect for hurricane preparedness now i had volunteered in the past uh, to be part of a dmat uh okay your medical assistance team Mm -hmm. uh for hurricane andrew that was way back in 1992 but i really have to say 
you know, for me, it was Hurricane Katrina in 2005 because it was then that I saw what happens when the ambulance really isn't just around the corner. I mean, yep. not that we didn't have hundreds of personnel, medical personnel converging on the Gulf Coast. Even that was happening even before the storm was over. Yep. But the providers and the technology just couldn't get to the people that needed it because of flooding. Yeah. Right. So with Katrina, it was flooding that separated victims from the medical help they needed. Right. But uh, an earthquake could make roads impassable. I mean, really, any disaster with enough casualties can overwhelm the current infrastructure and, uh, of course, the pandemic type diseases that are coming down the pike. I mean, if you have this one had a one percent death rate, mm-hmm. uh, if you find hats on that, a 10 percent death rate, then you're really go you're going to be in a downward spiral that uh, society might not be able to recover from. Not quickly. That's right. Not quickly. Absolutely. But um, my dad was military, so he, he had that mindset from my childhood. You know, we did a lot of camping. We had to start the fires and put up the, the tents. And he taught us a lot of skills that he wasn't saying, hey, the world might end one day. So I'm teaching you this stuff. But he was just sort of imparting. And he was also a Boy Scout. Right. So he was just, you know, teaching us these skills just naturally to pass them on. Um, but yeah, we had been in South Florida since 74. It was actually pretty quiet hurricane seasons for quite a while until Andrew, which is why everyone got, you know, so surprised with it being so horrible and nobody was really prepared for it because it had been so quiet. You know, every year you get the threat, the threat, the threat, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and then it doesn't fall. And people are like, ah, oh, whatever. It'll it'll turn. It's going to go somewhere other way, place. That It had been focused on a certain area, like where actually where he was living at the time. And I was down a little bit further inland and on a similar path of the hurricane. And it shifted overnight. It just took a left turn and went down to South Miami where it was not expected at all. They were supposed to get like, you know, light winds and some rain. And suddenly they were getting the full brunt. And those people were completely unprepared. Yeah, they were just completely whole. And nobody was even telling those folks, hey, you might lose electricity, get some stuff. They were just like, ah, it's not going to come anywhere near you. It's going to hit, you know, Broward Day County line. And it went south into Miami. Um, so they got whacked. But anyway, um, but we, we were figured, very prepared. Right. You know, as, me as a kid growing up with my dad being military, we always had stuff. But coming out publicly as as a medical doctor and talking about things that are definitely against the conventional medical wisdom, <laughs> yeah. that was something different. You know, we, we decided over time seeing that there wasn't really a actively licensed doctor that was medical doctor that was talking about this stuff or writing about this stuff. Uh, you know, we figured that if we could teach the average person how to deal with injuries and illness, maybe put some medical supplies in their hands that we might be able to avoid some of the deaths that are unnecessary deaths right. that occur right. because people just weren't prepared. Yeah. And so that's what, what, when our mission became to put medically prepared people in, in families and uh, what we're, our job is really to, have a cadre of you know trained medics you know family medics you know that will possibly save step some lives in times of trouble step up yeah right what Bring their supplies. How was it when you first came out as uh being into preparedness what how was that received and you know by your colleagues and stuff they were received as as i'm a nut that's <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much that's pretty much it no nah, that was not that many people that said that <laughs> Well, they didn't say I was okay. We didn't. The people who were looking at us <laughs> were people who wanted to find our stuff. So, you know, the mainstream doctors out there still don't know we exist because right. we're not in anybody's face. You know what I mean? Like, I have a YouTube channel, but if they look for that, they'll find my YouTube channel. You know what I mean? If they look for preparedness information, they might stumble upon our book in Amazon, but. Most doctors out there have no idea that there's someone like us speaking about things, you know, talking about in the book, you know, a a situation where they don't have all this equipment and diagnostic and lab tests and, you know, tell them exactly what's going on. That You might have to use your eyes and your ears and your fingers People you know, can't wrap figure their, out what's happening. Right. People can't wrap their heads around that concept. That, right. You know, you, 
you may wind up being the end of the line. You may be the highest medical asset left to your family in times of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, that's funny. You mentioned that, um, in 2012, I took over the security at the embassy in Baghdad. Um, and I, I had been other places and when the earlier in, in the, you know, Oh four, Oh five, Oh six, they had these great mass casualty plans. And in 2012, when I get up there, um, I got asked to come to the the health unit and they were going to talk about this, you know, about a, a mass casualty plan. I get there. Well, somewhere along the lines and, and changing over the health unit every year or every two years, uh, they, the, the old mass casualty plan got tossed out. No one remembered it. And it was like, we're not, no one had a thought about it. I mean, you're in Baghdad. You think you'd, that'd be one of the first things. And I remember the, um, uh, I think she was a doc and we're in this meeting and she's, you know, and she's like, well, if we have a problem, everybody's coming to the health unit and the health unit was kind of on an exterior perimeter. And I said, well, what's your plan if the health unit's gone? You know, what's your plan if, if, cause you know, they have these 240 millimeter rockets that would go through the, like would just tear it, destroy a building. And I said, well, what's your plan? And she's like, well, why would we all be gone? I'm like, well, cause if you're, if right. you're healthy, the health unit's blown up or you're dead or something else, what's your backup plan? Cause when I, when I was a medic overseas, I always trained my team yeah. Because I want them to be able to work on me if I got hurt. And the one time we got smashed out, that's ended up exactly what happened. It was like they need I needed somebody to help me out. Yep. So um no, it's it's good that you're doing that. I think everybody needs to be their own first responder in, in this stuff, especially with medicine. Well, I'll tell you that yeah. the the attitude that that physician over over there had is basically the attitude of almost all physicians here now. You know, is that they really can't imagine a situation where they wouldn't have, you know, their the high technology that's available to them now. They, they, they can't imagine a situation where that would not be accessible. Right. And so this is this is a problem and this is a, a mindset issue that needs to change with medical personnel, but not only them, but it needs to change with every person and every, whoever is going to be the medically responsible person in every family. They need to realize that there's a situation where they're going to be the highest medical asset left. And if they are, they need to be able to deal with the, at least the common issues that may occur in uh, a unstable society. Well, what kind of freaks me out is that, you know, we had years of uncertainty. Is the world going to end? Is this COVID going to mutate where it kills everybody? I mean, we had a near-death experience, and usually when people have a near-death experience, they're a different person on the other side of that. There were people who didn't go seek care, care probably knowing they had cancer or knowing they had some kind of issue. They avoided the hospital, but they didn't do anything else at home because they didn't know what to do. I mean, there was so many situations where, you know, it, it could have been really, really worse and if, like you said, we had a five or ten percent death rate, you know, portion of those are going to be doctors, going to be nurses, going to be lab techs, going to be, you know, the truckers that that bring the supplies to the hospital. I know I had trouble getting medical supplies during the pandemic mm -hmm. because things weren't being shipped from China. China stopped, and there, China is where all the med medical stuff comes from. You know, we all want to buy American. That's great. Well, nobody makes gauze in America. No one makes Band-Aids in America or hydrogen peroxide or alcohol wipes or betadine wipes or anything that's in the hospital, anything. Every single thing that's in the hospital comes from China. So they stopped bringing a lot of stuff over. So hospitals were scrambling to get supplies. They'd run out of stupid stuff like gloves and masks and, and hand sanitizer. Remember the hand sanitizer yeah. shortage? You know, there were people who made whiskey who started making hand sanitizer instead. I mean, you would think that things like that, the toilet paper shortage, if if nothing else is going to wake you up, that we have a supply problem and it's all not coming from here. If you can't get toilet paper, what do you think is happening to everything else? I mean, why aren't we all preppers now? I, it, I just don't get it. I like Bongo, people yeah. come back so much to normal, like, oh yeah, it's all gonna be there. I'm like, you saw the meat mark the meat department empty. We had a situation there was not even a piece of hamburger in the meat department. It was empty. It goes it goes back it goes back to that um too, to what you just said, right? That 
that was a 1%, give or take, whatever it was, lethality rate of, of people dying for whatever reason during COVID. And, and now, you know, if you push that up to five to 10% with how society reacted then, I, I think we I think we'd be in full meltdown mode. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. We, absolutely. We had hospitals that were were overcrowded, uh, and, and draconian measures being taken uh, by by government, state governments, and the federal government. The, the federal government. I mean, there's all sorts of crazy things that are going to happen, and a lot of a lot of basic basic services that may not be available. I mean, you would, if it's 10% death rate in the general population, it'd probably be 20% among medical personnel. Cause they're the and, ones who are getting exposed to it. And, they're the ones who are stepping in. It's like you as a military guy, you had more of a chance of getting a gunshot wound than your family at home in, in their, in your hometown, you know, they're putting themselves in the face of danger. And that's what you know, when you work in a hospital and that's where all of the contagious people are coming, they're more likely to get sick, you know, mess up with their mask or their glove or take something off wrong. With this, with, with COVID this time around, the CDC actually said that if you have a mild to moderate case of COVID, that you should take care of that person at home. You know, yes. Where, so home care. That's right. Home care. And so, you know, we wrote about how to put together survival uh sick rooms and things like that yeah you know so these are some of the things that they had to do an isolation room but most people don't know how to do that how do you move from you know the household where there's people who aren't sick into the location where the sick person is and then how do you you know decontaminate yourself before you're moving back into the area where the non-sick is you know you need to have an area where you're either getting dressed or doing some you know protocol, taking care of the person, then going back into that area, decontaminating yourself with, you know, whatever it is that that is affecting the person. So, you know, people just don't know these things. They don't understand. I guess, you know, what makes me worry sometimes too, when I think about this, um, is that if a more serious virus, bacteria, whatever comes around, that the the politics of it all have people so entrenched on each side that especially on the preparedness side uh yeah i mean well it's not like we're any more entrenched than the other side is i guess but that people would be quick to discount it and my experience is if you discount a virus until you know what in until it proves out one way or the other you might be in a world of hurt might be too late yeah, because yeah. because the virus doesn't the virus doesn't care what your politics are, and so you know I I think we got lucky that it wasn't as lethal as it was, but you know it, I I remember early in like February and March people that were just making these statements ah this isn't anything it's like yeah you don't know that yet it's very yeah. true I warned all of our family the third week in January mm-hmm. I sent out text messages to everybody and I said go shopping right now. And I gave them a list of things to go get. And I went and I went to Costco. I made a huge order from my medical supply company who were like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know, getting some extra stuff. You know, I ran out of everything. I had huge deliveries of gauze and mylar blankets and triangular bandages and all the stuff that I needed for to make medical kits. And I was like, and then they they had limits of what I could order. So they would say, you can only order one box of gloves this month. You can order one box of gauze. So then they everything was limited. Things were delayed by by months. And I was like the little mouse in the factory trying to find the cheese, but the cheese factory closed. I was just going everywhere. I go to the 10th page of Google to find some supplies <laughs> just to keep putting the kits together. It was rough. It was really rough. One of the questions I want to ask you is <laughs> it, it leads into like, what's the, what is your concept of disaster preparedness medicine and how it's becoming more and more important these days? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, almost everything that you get in terms of information, your books that, that you can get on disaster 
or survival medicine. I mean, they're actually a book on modern emergency medicine. So, you know, what really is, I mean, is there really a definition for disaster medicine or survival medicine? How does it differ from just modern emergency care or, right. or even, even wilderness medicine? There's a difference. I mean, yeah. routine emergency medicine is geared toward dealing with injuries that are incurred in normal times that might include a mishap during a wilderness hike or maybe a trip to an underdeveloped country, things like that. And in these cases, uh, modern care and facilities, they exist. They're just not there. Just They're just not right there. there. Right, They're right. not readily available. So in, in standard emergency medicine, the assumption is that the person will eventually make their way to trained doctors, right. modern hospitals at one point or another. And you, individual, you, preparedness person, you know, are a temporary caregiver and responsible only for stabilization and transport, but not much more. Right. And the average citizen, you know, knows that it doesn't extend to the entire course of care and recovery. And and that's the thing. So what's your primary goal when you see somebody that's sick or injured on the street? I mean, your goal is to evacuate that person to uh, a modern medical facility, right. do what you can for them. But those facilities, maybe they're miles away from your current location, but you want to get them there. You don't you you have that luxury of not having to deal with them from beginning to end. But that's very, very different from long term survival medicine right. In a true collapse of society. There's not going to be access to modern medical care. There's not going to be even potential for such access in, in the foreseeable future. And um, and Harry Truman used to say, you know, the buck stops here. Well, you know, that arrow, when it comes to a medical issue, medical issues in times of trouble, that arrow is that says here, that's pointing right at you. Right. And so, you know, you go from being this temporary first aid provider, you know, cert person, the first responder person to being the caregiver at the end of the line. That's tough. I mean, you got somebody with a broken bone, you got to take care of them until that bone heals. I mean, that doesn't happen overnight. You have somebody with an open wound, you have to make decisions. Do I close that wound? Do I leave that wound open, allow it to granulate in on its own? And how do I take care of it during that time? I mean, this requires an entire change in the mindset when you know that there's no help on the way. I mean, now or in, or in the near future in that you know, and, and this is important because people are going to live or die based on your actions. Yep. And if you don't think about things in that mindset, then you're going to wind up just having a lot of people die. And that's why we wrote this book. Our, our book assumes yep. that you are alone. You've got limited supplies. And, and you know, as a family medic, and, and we gear the book in plain English to make you effective in that role. Yeah. That's great. I think that's so important. You know, you I saw it in the third world countries. You get down there and there's, you know, it, there's people that go out and hang their shingle on the side of a mud hut or a, you know, a little plywood shack that say, I'm a doctor. They're not a doctor. They've never been to medical. They're just saying they're a doctor and they're doing stuff. I think being your own first responder, being your own medical thing, you know, that's so important. What do you, and, you know, it, it's kind of like the definition is sort of changing in a way of the way we look at things. The paradigm shifted with how we look at medicine years ago, four years, five years ago. Disaster medicine, I think there was a different aspect the way people looked at it. With everything that's happening in the world, just like the conversation we just had about what's going on, at least for here in the U.S. and maybe some of the developed countries, what do you think are some of the medical um emergencies, medical, you know, things that people need to be up to speed on and understand in order to be that sort of, uh, you know, modern day disaster person, medicine person, because that, 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 they're going to be on their own or they're, they are their own first responder. Well, you have to be able to take care of very basic things. I mean, you have to do, you have to deal with be able to deal with dehydration due to, let's say, lack of drinking water. You yeah. need to know how to disinfect your drinking water because there's you know very, a lot of infections that are diarrheal diseases that can cause you to wind up becoming dehydrated. And once you're dehydrated, well, I mean, most of the most of the soldiers that died in the Civil War died because of dehydration due to dysentery and stuff like that. And that not not from bullets or shrapnel. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to deal with that. You also need to be able to observe and enforce the proper preparation of food. I mean, I mean, it's thought that 
even things like Ebola were passed to humans in Africa for failing to completely cook bush meat. You know, they were they were eating these flying foxes and things like that, and they were eating, cooking them over 55 gallon drums. And, uh, you know, they were probably half cooking them before they ate them. And so so that happens. You got to be able to understand and be able to deal with uh, illness that's related to um, climate uh hypothermia due to cold exposure you need to be able to know how to deal with heat stroke because um, people are going to be driven from their homes in a lot of areas uh, and with the power grid failing you know they're going to wind up you know people that are used to being in air conditioning down here in south florida they're going to die from heat stroke <laughs> people that are used to heat heat up in minnesota they're going to be freezing to death. So things like you need to be able to deal with that, know how to recognize people who are having uh, a heat exhaustion or heat stroke or, or under hypothermia and how to deal with those issues. You need to be able to to know you need to know how to deal with orthopedic injuries, orthopedic injuries that, you know, there, people are going to be exerting themselves they're going to be doing things that are activities of daily survival they're not used to doing so there's going to be sprains and strains and broken bones yeah. uh injuries due to lack of using hand protection eye protection you need to be able to deal with all these things then of course there are those minor infections that we have every day i mean everybody's gotten an infection i got a, actually um I was, I was, i got a, a cellulitis a soft tissue infection from uh being um Stabbed Stab by, a, a, by a low plant, a, right? With an aloe plant oh, needle, needle, an agave it's plant needle it. through the through the genes too. And it got oh, in, wow! It, yeah, it got infected right through my genes, and uh, and indeed, you know, that's if I didn't have antibiotics, I mean, that could have spread and entered my bloodstream, and I could have I could have easily have died from it. Yeah, it got and you bad need high. to be you need to be able to recognize these things and deal with them quickly. To be able to to survive and of course i'm not even talking about trauma from you know bleeding. hostile bleeding, counters yes. you know bleeding, open no, wound, bleeding. bleeding and worse bleeding wounds properly so, so these are some of the things that are are, are basic to the uh, survival medics yeah. uh, armamentarium he's got to have the medical knowledge and the tools to deal with these things they've got to be in the survival medicine cabinet yeah. on the wound care and, and some of what you're talking about what is the impact of you know if someone's in a grid down situation someone's in one of these extended disasters what's the impact of the stress the overall environment the cleanliness the lack of sleep the lack of comfort what does that play on their immune system no i think the wreaks havoc wreaks havoc with it is certainly not uh, any situation where you're in a uh, unsanitary situation where where you're going to go forever without ever getting sick and when you get sick you have less options in terms of antibiotics and things like that to to deal with the these infections and 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 things and and you end up winding with a bad outcome compared to what we would have in normal times and so we're going to have we're going to have people dying unnecessarily because of lack of antibiotics and and interestingly enough uh, i'm glad you mentioned that because I was the first doctor to write about something called fish antibiotics. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, yeah. but we uh, not only were medical professionals, but we also raised tilapia in ponds <laughs> and, and, you know, and we uh, had fish. ornamental <laughs> tropical fish too, and, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, we realized we're one of the first people to realize that, you know what, the antibiotics that they give fish, you know, a pet guppy were actually the same thing. They were actually, human human antibiotics and they came only in human dosages so your pet guppy got the same dose of amoxicillin that a 180 pound adult male human would get and so we figured out that these things are things that we were able to use yeah and for 20 years after starting to write about these things uh you know people were able to get these things through various online outlets well just a couple of months ago the uh, fda issued a warning to chewy.com and every else everywhere else that had fish antibiotics and selling selling them to the public online. that they consider these to be new animal drugs and they are not approved for use so therefore you can no longer sell them and so that's exactly what happened there and so no one now can get antibiotics 
it from in, in quantity in quantity i'm talking about you can get them from some of these companies that you know you 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 go through them get a televisit or something like that and you can get you some antibiotics a prescription right now but you need an, now you need a prescription yeah. for all of these things and you can only get them from these places once a year so if you're if you're let's say the medic for a survival group that has 20 people in it okay you can get a little box of four or five antibiotics, one course. And you know how that's going to last you about two months after the shit, after you know what comes down. <laughs> Sorry about that's that. Fine. <laughs> no worries no worries so so what let me just explain he's he's shift from talking about fish antibiotics now you're talking about human antibiotics it's telemedicine there's some companies now that do telemedicine and they'll send you a little kit like but again the once a year you can only get once a year then the problem is is that you need yes there you go and yes the, the problem is and you can't get another one of those the problem is yeah. for a full year the problem is medic is that you need 500 amoxicillin right if you're yeah. going to be taking care of a group yeah if your friend gets sick and he might use up most of your stuff and then you have nothing for you when you get sick and in the past you were able to do that you could get you want 500 doxycycline there it is you want 500 zithromycin there it is 500 amoxicillin you can get it well can't do it anymore and so, you know, I, I think that this is one less tool, very important tool. And I think there are people that are eventually are going to die unnecessary deaths as a result of this. There was a 2010, I think, uh, History Channel program called After Armageddon. I don't know yeah. if you saw it, but in, in there, in that um, show, uh, a paramedic takes his family after a some kind of uh society ending event and eventually makes his way through the land through the landscape to a survival community right and he of course they put him to work and he's gardening winds up getting an infection uh cellulite is very similar to what i got yep. and he knows he recognizes it's infected so he goes to the the, I think the it medic on his arm what on the, yeah on yeah, his arm, his arm. Uh, he goes to the medic for the community they don't have antibiotics. He can't find antibiotics anywhere, so he slowly watches himself become septic, and he dies. Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing that's going to happen as a result of not being able to get free access to the amount of antibiotics that are necessary to be able to deal with, to, to be able to help an actual community survive. Yeah. You know, the kinds of infections that can run rampant. So, so these companies are great, you know, for a, a very small amount of mm -hmm. supplies but they won't give you more than once a year so, so you can't accumulate through these companies and it's very interesting um that one of the companies has on their website they talk about one of the founders and he says he works very closely with the government oh it's on, it's on the bio page great and i thought i had been thinking like who really alerted this FDA? Who who, who made it so important to get rid of fish antibiotics? And I was like, oh, maybe you shouldn't say that you work closely with the government on your bio. I didn't know that. Uh, yes. And I think it might be the one he held up. Well, but anyway, somebody, somebody, oh, really? has, somebody has an interest somebody blew in the getting whistle. rid of the fish antibiotics. So who was that? So now fish are getting sick. Yes. Yeah, we have we have hundreds of fish. I mean, thankfully, I have tons of antibiotics. I, I was smart. I've got them. And I mean, we could, you know, call in something. He could call in something for me, you know, but most people can't do that. Right. You know, they can't go to the store and just, you know, pick up a prescription like we can. They don't have access to that. So who are they calling? You're going to call your vet and say, my guppy has you know, some white <laughs> fungus on it. Can you help me out? Be like, right. I, they're not taught about fish. They're not, they're, they're not taught to diagnose these hobby fish issues. There are books and books on those things. And, you know, we're as the hobbyist mm -hmm. is supposed to figure that out and then give the right antibiotic for our little fishies. There's right. not, we're not supposed to have to call a vet for that, <laughs> you know? <gasps> yeah, that's wild. You, you know, I didn't even, I didn't even, I, you're, this is the first I've heard about the fish antibiotics going away. Cause you know, I was just in tractor supply yesterday and they're still, you know, they still have ivermectin. It's all behind lock and key now. Yeah. That, that's wild. I hadn't heard about that. That the reason why bad. they can sell horse stuff because 
That's not human antibiotics. So there is a whole industry uh, that makes well, it is a human- some animal medicine. Well, I, I get that, honey, but they specifically make medicine for horses. That is a big industry. There was no antibiotic production for hobby fish. These people were taking human antibiotics and buying them and then rebottling them and, you know, selling them. The reason why we talked about preppers getting the preparedness community getting these antibiotics fish antibiotics is because they came already in the dosage that was in necessary for an adult human and right. a pediatric dose right. for a, chi- a child right they, exactly the dose there ain't no horse antibiotic that comes right. in the dose for you or for your five-year-old you know that's yeah. the thing and these came exactly the same as the human antibiotic that matter of fact down to the color and of the, of the capsule and the numbers and letters on on the pill itself so these were easy because you didn't have to titrate them you know it wasn't a cat right. a dog antibiotic that you say well, okay let's see my dog this is a for a 30 pound dog so i got to take uh six times the dose or or, or a horse antibiotic that says well let's see my well, horse weighs 980 pounds liquids too yeah they're injectable which doesn't last very long as far as a preparedness situation the liquid stuff goes bad so that's not even an right. option any of the liquid antibiotics so wow that's yeah. wild <laughs> it's a Shut sad up. situation for the preparedness world it yeah and it shouldn't surprise me i guess i'm a little bit surprised but it, it it shouldn't surprise me you know people always ask they say um hey and, and this kind of goes off on the the medicine tangent they say you know hey i have i'm diabetic or uh, you know type 2 diabetic or i'm this i i take the, these pills how should they how can they go about getting stocking up on more stuff is it reasonable to ask your doctor hey i'm going on a trip for several months what what do you recommend for that well you could but again things like insulin they're just not going to last very long right there are expiration dates on those so the people who are insulin dependent diabetics are kind of in a pickle there Um, now if you're talking about say chronic conditions like high blood pressure or somebody who's a type 2 diabetic who takes metformin or you know some thyroid generic problems, or... thyroid you know the, the, they're on some solid pills not injectables right. um so there's two things you can do you can possibly ask your doctor again you know make a story up i'm going somewhere you know see if you you know hopefully you have a good rapport with this doctor if it's a doctor you just met don't even bother trying because they're going to be looking at you like you're crazy um but so if you've known this person for a while say listen i'd like to have some extra what if i can't get in touch with you you know i might be going somewhere maybe you're gone your backup doctor doesn't call me back i i want an extra prescription they might just say yes if not your insurance company will not make you take your 28th pill out of your bottle before you can refill your medicine. We all know we can go a little early. So ask the pharmacy when you pick up your prescription, when can I come back? It might be on the 20th day, it might be on the 19th day, it might be on the 21st day, but it's always going to be early. So uh, every day that's early is an extra pill that's now for storage. Now continue to take the old prescription you already have, but make sure you go as soon as they tell you. And when you go to pick the next one up, say, when can I come refill this? Every time you do that and you have seven to 10 pills extra, always take the old. We know you're rotating food storage. Take the old pills first. You've got the new prescription is backed up here. And then maybe you've even got another prescription. Depends on how many times you've done this. So these newer ones are your storage in case something happens here. But you take the, the old ones first and you always ask, when can I come? When can I want? And you'll go early. And every day you go early is extra pills. They're, they're yeah. storage pills. Because that you still sense. have those when that other one runs out. You'll still have those extra pills. And every time you do that, you might get seven pills. And over the course of time, you know, 10 months, you might have 70 extra pills. Just doing that consistently. Go the first day they allow you to refill. That makes sense. Yeah. That, and that it just really makes sure people have to be disciplined and pay attention. That's what we do. Yeah. That's preparedness, right? Being prepared. Set a phone um, reminder. Now, I, mean, I want to say one other thing that, you know, staying healthy in a survival setting 
involves starting off healthy. So right. you need to be as healthy as you possibly can. If you have a bum knee right now, you know, you should use the modern technology that exists right now to get it fixed before a disaster happens. So if, if you have vision and uh, vision problems and uh, uh, say you're nearsighted and you're chained to your glasses or your contacts, I mean, consider getting a LASIK procedure done. I mean, get get the 2020. I mean, I, I did. I had one of the first LASIK procedures in our area, gosh, probably 30 years ago, maybe. Yeah. And uh, I have the eyes of an eagle, a really, really old eagle, but <laughs> an eagle. Oh, really? Now, is something with Lasix, I, I was told that it will either give you far vision or near vision. W- what is both. that? My fir- the first time I had Lasix was 30 years ago, and it, and it corrected. I, I was blind as a bat, you know, For m- far very away. nearsighted. Very nearsighted. Nearsighted, and it may, gave me 2015 vision. Over the course of time, as I got older, you know, my vision changed, and so I had trouble reading. And so what I did is I had one one eye changed, uh, one eye done, so that I can read. And they can actually adjust it so that you can read with one eye, right. and the other eye you see uh it, 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 you see uh, long distance and it's your brain your brain actually switches over from yeah. short short range to long range uh, and it's so amazing what it, for age and it's amazing what uh what now what i did mine your body does 25 years ago i did both eyes again i was young you know you're you're in your 30s and you can see fine. You can read everything fine in your 30s. You don't need reading glasses for the most part. So you, they almost always fix you so now you can see far away. Right. You can drive. You can see street signs. And so I can still see far away fine. But as I got older, I've I've lost this. Yeah. So when he lost it, he got one eye fixed. Um, I just like for this scenario, I put in one contact. So I have one contact for reading. And then my other eye can still see far away. And sometimes we'll do that when we go out to dinner, just because I don't want to put my reading glasses on to like look at the menu and stuff. But so as we get older, then you do have to decide because you've lost your your reading because all the young people can read fine. It's far away mostly that people can't see for the most part. So then you have to decide like, okay, do I want to see here or do I want to see there? And so I can still see far away, but if I want to get fixed like him, I need one eye made for reading. Otherwise, is that I, awkward when you first get that done? He didn't have a problem. I had no problem. My brain just naturally, you know, okay, oh, this side's gonna gonna read, and this side's gonna look at the you know at, at the outfield to see if they uh, catch the fly ball. No, I've had you know, my and it, and it works fine. I've had my contact in. Still works fine. Since I just put it in just before we started this. And, you know, I look up, I can see far away and I look down at papers and I can read. So I do think that I would be okay doing it, but it, it makes me a little nervous. So <laughs> I, I, wore, I put on some glasses because the doctor had mentioned that to me a couple of years ago. And I put on, I got, it made me nauseous when, when I, when I did it at first. And I was like, oh, that's why I wear these stupid <laughs> readers when I do this. I, 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 my eyes are so bad that. I, I thought about that. I'm like, wow, before having, before they invented glasses, if I was that person, I'd be screwed. Like there's oh, nothing I, I could do. No, I can't. I can barely see my hands in focus. I had a minus it's- four diopter nearsightedness, which is basically, you know, like this, your, your lenses are like this thick. Oh yeah. And, uh, it, t- it took them 10 seconds. Yeah. 10 seconds to, to correct it. Yeah, I had mine was I mean, nine seconds on one about, and 11 on the other. Took seconds. about 15 minutes to prepare me, get me in the chair and stuff like that. But the actual operation itself took exactly 10 seconds. And my oldest daughter just had it done. Just one. This, that was it. My oldest daughter that, had it done. Oh, right, yes. Right. January, she just, just, had, just it. had it done. Yeah. Oh, wow. Is that done in like just a re- an optometrist office or do you have to go to oh, a surgical no. center? Ophthalmologist. Yeah, there's ophthalmologist. a place that has all the machines and that's all they do yeah, yeah. usually there's a yeah a location lasik location wow i might have to look into that because i'm getting really tired of these glasses I I'm, know. you know what it really i i get tired of too it's not i don't mind wearing the glasses but i have to put it on the to, to when i eat food because otherwise now my food looks blurry and it's like it all it gives me this idea that there's mold on my food <laughs> oh my, and what are you eating you know yeah, i mean right, like yeah. i look right it's true then yeah I, I like can't see my food i understand can't read a menu 
I've gone into restaurants and forgot my readers and I just hand him the menu. I'm like, I, you got to tell me what's on it because I there's no way. I have no idea what's here. Yeah. It's a disability. What, what, what's that? It's a disability. You know? It is. It, it's, a, it's a brutal disability. Yeah. What are not some other one, healthy not stuff? Not you want to have in, in survival settings. Yeah. No, it's terrible. What are some other things that people can do on the front end of a disaster while times are good that you think, especially in the preparedness community, to get themselves as, you know, as healthy as possible for going into something like this? Well, I mean, I think that some things that are important to do is to, you know, be active, exercise. You need to uh, make sure that you are, have a good set of vitamins in your system. You know, you may want to take a multivitamin. I think that's a good idea. I, I think that people should have multivitamins as part of their survival medicine cabinet as well, because in a survival setting, what's going to happen is you're going to have st- dietary restrictions based on what's there, right. and it may not give you all the vitamins that you need. So, you you know, you don't want to wind up getting scurvy be simply because you didn't buy a bottle of multivitamins right. Right. that had vitamin C in it. I mean, you don't have to take these things every day like they tell you to. You can take them when, once a week, and that would probably be enough to prevent you from uh, suffering any hypovitaminosis or, you know, vitamin deficiency. Uh, that, that I think is something that people don't do. I mean, that's one of the, one of the mistakes I think people don't do is they, they don't get the right, uh, over-the-counter medicines, uh, over-the-counter supplements that might be able to improve their chances of survival. And when, when food is, scarce you know you're going to not get the nutrition you need and you might need to have some vitamins yeah you know not not necessarily multi mega vitamins but i'm just talking about you know just once in a while is have have take a vitamin once a week or something like that and that probably would prevent you from having a a true vitamin deficiency i I also really just want to reemphasize the exercise you know, in, in preparing for us having to do things that we're not used to doing, like chopping wood or making fires, um, you know, if you don't have any muscle, it's going to be really tough for you to, you know, haul water. I mean, our, we have a water source. Thankfully, we have a lake behind our house. Um, of course, it's shared by several families. So who knows what they'll be dumping in it. Um, but, you know, I, if I want water, I'm going to have to go somewhere and get it. And water is very, very heavy. Um, so definitely getting in shape as as much as you can is yeah. really, really important. And also, also, go ahead. No. And also being aware, knowing how to do some basic things, you know, knowing the proper way to actually chop wood yes. would probably be a good idea. So you don't get wood chips. Getting some safety your, equipment getting for it. Personal protection gear, yep. you know, so you don't get a wood chip in your in your eye you know uh, if you're going to be using an axe you maybe want to have hand protection so you don't cut your hand you know i mean there there are a lot of different things you want to you know know how to make a fire so you don't wind up burning yourself exactly i mean these are things that people don't really practice you know uh, maybe you're a camper and you do but you would be part of a small minority of people that actually do this on a regular basis and when people don't have a lot of experience doing things what happens is they wind up getting injured yeah you know or or they maybe not know that the kids shouldn't be that close to a fire to the fire (laughs) you know and their kid gets burned you know (laughs) things like that i mean these are things that you know a lot of people just don't think about and, and it's important because prevention an ounce of that prevention is worth a pound of the, of any cure, and it will relieve headaches so for, for the medic and maybe heartaches in some cases. So supplies. So we're talking about getting a you know supplies, right? And that's that's what people don't realize is that you know a true in a true long long term disaster, you need to have lots and lots of supplies and people greatly underestimate the amount of medical supplies that they need. You know, throw a liter of of, of water on the floor. And imagine that it's blood and take your gauze and that you happen to have in your medical kit and sop it up. I bet you have gone through your entire survival storage of gauze and you still probably haven't sopped up the entire thing. So you don't have enough supplies. I'm telling your your (laughs) audience right now, you don't have enough supplies. I often talk to preppers who have, you know, several firearms and, you know, thousands of rounds of ammunition. (laughs) 
They got the beans they and the bullets. They can make the holes. <laughs> yeah, they got the beans and the bullets, but they sure they sorely lack the bandages. I mean, right. they so, they have. Right. <laughs> yeah, most people have just a single eye fact. They don't realize that they're going to have to deal with multiple injuries and illnesses over time, and this means that supplies are going to be expended before you know it, especially if it's more than just you. Right. I mean, an extended family, a mutual assistance group, big group, going to need multiples of each items. And yep. people also don't realize the medic needs to learn how to treat. Not just the se- sexy, sensational issues like, you know, massive bleeding and things like that. You need to know how to stop bleeding, but you need to know how to treat blisters. You need to know how to deal with rashes, athletes put things like that. It isn't all gunfights at the yoga kick around. Right, right. You know, they need more than ju- just military style tourniquets in your in your medical kit to deal with most of the stuff that you're going to be faced with as the, as the medic. I mean, there are simple items that can be helpful, a gold bond powder, you know, oh, low yeah. in, hydrocortisone cream. All of this stuff should be part of the survival medicine cabinet. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's all stuff I carried. It was, in, you know, you mentioned the bandages and, and I've, I've told people when I've taught different classes, it's my, on the outside of my aid bag, when I was overseas, I carried it. I had a towel. Um, I was like, that's what you need to sop up blood. Like, you know, you're, you're going to dump your entire, you could have your backpack full of, full of gauze. You're going to dump it. If somebody gets a serious, serious injury, you're going to lose all that gauze. So, yeah. you know, carry it, carry a towel. And like you mentioned the gold bond and all that, that stuff, you'll use that stuff more often than you'll use any, you know, any tourniquet that you have. Not that, you know, tourniquets are, are, you know, they're obviously I hope. good to have. Yeah. I hope. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that that that's true. So what skills do you recommend people pursue to prepare for disaster medicine and all this? Oh, geez. <laughs> oh, wow. We huge, Where do we start? I have I have a huge list. I have I have a list that would be several pages long. I mean, you basically you need to know how to perform uh, a basic history and physical. You take vital signs. You know. Pulses, respiration rates, blood pressures, things like that would be useful. Know what things sound like and what things should feel like. Right. And you know if there's something that's, you know, kind of off. And right. comparing both sides of a human is great. Like, oh, this is a little higher than this side. Maybe we right. have a problem. You know, this finger's going in a different direction than the other fingers. So there are clues to know when something's wrong, but you should know what things sound like and what they feel like. You should know how to deal with orthopedic injuries, your splint pad and, and wrap, let's say, a sprain. Um, you should know how how to close a wound with various different methods, you know, glues and um, uh, sutures and things like that, and when to leave it open. We have, uh, yeah. we have a, a number of usbs and videos on on our youtube channel uh that uh that, that teach you when to do it when not to do it because uh, that's that's a very important um let's see uh, how how to basically how to identify things that's important that's yeah. really important i mean yeah. you need to be able to identify when somebody's got a cold and some when somebody has pneumonia right there's a there's a difference and you know you could tell simply by listening to to somebody's lungs and it, it, there's an obvious obvious change and we have uh, uh i think our, our survival medicine seminar has uh, oh yeah it has sounds so we, oh, have, do, we have sounds that you yeah, can we, hear the the breathing right, yeah right we have we have all sorts of usbs you know on well, our, we have on one our website. US, well i have two usbs one is a suture staple class um and it has five different um sections on it and then one is the survival medicine and it goes through i have four main topics there and then i added a bunch of bonus videos that actually were just our youtube videos you can see me suturing you can yes. see me stapling yes. wounds yes things like that and, and we basically give our suture staple lecture with all of our powerpoints but you hear us teaching it so it's as if we're giving you the class and then i have one on how to set up a sterile field and how to uh, prep the patient um, so anyway, there's five in that. And then there's uh, survival medicine, which is kind of what he's talking about right now, all these different skills and um, showing the most common issues that we feel people are going to run into. And how do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? You know, what's the long term treatment? So that's uh, one of the the videos. Then there's also a pandemic preparedness video. And then the other one is medical supplies. So we go through all kinds of medical supplies and talk about them and why you need them 
um, on that section. And we and we have all of these supplies in, on our store. We have an entire line of medical kits that have been designed. We pack them right here in the USA we on do. demand, <laughs> on demand, and we customize and them. We pack them sometimes right. too. <laughs> right, we we it could, could be us. Sun. Could be us personally. And, yes, and we customize different kits for. We've done that for fire departments, for uh, police. police departments, church, church security, church, church security. Yeah, I've actually created different kits that I do sell now Proper. because. I've been contacted by a particular uh, community, school, municipality, and they wanted a certain kind of kit. And I've, I'd be like, okay, well, that's actually pretty cool. Now I'll sell that kit too. So like I'm, nice. my multi-person was created for a church. So the church security team leader got in touch with me and he's like, I want a kit and I want to be able to put it in d- different areas in the church to take care of multiple people. And I have this great trifold bag um, that folds out and has three sections. So I filled each section with the supplies you would need for a bleeding wound. The exact whether same supplies. Good, whether it's gunshot or stab or whatever for a bleeding wound. And so those can be thrown to different people who might be in different locations. And, hand, and can handle basically life-threatening Bleeding. Bleeding. Stop hemorrhaging. For three separate people in that one kit. Nice. So that, that's but, but we do we do that kind of thing. And, th- and this is a, the kind of thing that we really try to get people to to realize that they need more medical supplies. We don't care if you get them from us. I <laughs> yeah, mean, just get them. <laughs> you know, just get them. Just get them. You know, yeah. that's that's the main that's the main thing, because people don't realize how much and how fast these things are going to be expended. And they have to have more than they think they need. And the reason why that it's it's useful to have more. I mean, if you have more, if you want to barter them yep. for other barter things, yep. you might be able to use that. But, you know, despite that, I tell I tell people instead of bartering things, I think that people that the medic for an area should freely give of their supplies and give of their training and their their expertise, you know, to the community. Because once you get known as the medic who's going to be able to help people in the area, then you're going to be so valuable to that area that people are going to expend supplies to protect you. Yeah. Feed you. you are that because you are <laughs> speaking of supplies, there's a lot of new people coming into the preparedness community right now, right? You look at some of the Facebook groups and they're there's some of the bigger Facebook groups I know out, out there that are adding two, three, four, five hundred people a day right now. Wow. And one of the questions I get asked a lot is, hey, where do I start? What do I need? When it comes to the medical supply side of the house, if you're starting from zero right now, what do you recommend somebody look at to assemble a kit that will, and maybe have one on your site that um, will get them get them up and going so that they're that they're fairly confident in what they what they have on hand? Okay, hands down, the first thing they have to do is buy the book. And I'm not saying that because I made the book. I'm just saying this because this is going to help you organize yourself. I have a huge section in here just on medical supplies with a checklist, with a little box that you can check off. And it goes on and on, family, community, hospital, OB, eye supplies, herbal medicine supplies, pediatric supplies, dental supplies, on and on. So... This is where you can organize yourself and you can go in there and say, okay, I have this, 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 and this. Now I see these other things that I'm missing. And it helps you think about maybe how many people you're going to be taking care of. We go through some of the things we talked about, um, the skills that you need to learn, where you can learn them. I mean, this book really brings all of the medical education together. And I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned dental because we have an entire section on dental, everything from how to identify a, de- a decaying tooth yeah, to in the how to extract the tooth if you yeah. needed to. Uh, you know, it, people don't realize that, it, well, let me say this, that during Vietnam, 50% of the sick call patients that presented to medics there were for dental reasons, right. mm. not for medical reasons right. so if you're going to be the the medic for a survival group and you're going to end up off the grid because of some society ending event you're going to be seeing as many people there for issues relating to 
dental problems as you are for medical problems. That's and so true. this is why it's a very important for you to have some knowledge with regards to that. There's a good book called Where There Is No Dentist. Yep. That's very useful. We have an entire, uh, our, our section tells you everything that you need to know with regards to, you know, pulling teeth, pulling and, teeth, uh, knock teeth that are knocked right, out, how to fill. broken teeth, how to do, how to replace lost fillings. You know, there, there's part that's part and parcel of being an effective ro- a medic. All right. So step number one, get the book, get it in color because the pictures we added are pretty oh, wow. amazing. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you've seen the color version, no, but not we go through our trauma. I mean, it, it's just incredible how to step by steps in here. Um, so we don't leave you hanging. We don't say, oh, go do this, and then don't tell you how to do it. So that's one of the changes we made from the third edition to the fourth edition was we pulled out some of the text because my husband likes to be, you know, sort of professor-ish. And I said, well, in nursing, our nursing books, the way we learn things is we have it numbered. And this is the first thing you do and the second thing you do and the third thing you do. And we, we follow that. You know, that's our formula. Whereas, you know, doctor books are very like, oh, and you have this and you might have that. (laughs) I'm like, okay, now we need to pull this down. That's great. I'm I'm loving what you're doing there. But now let's tell them exactly what to do. So there are hundreds of how to in this book. That was like my touch of this book was we're going to pull the words out of the paragraphs and we're going to just throw it there. And this now now they know what to do. Do this, 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 and this. And when you get to the bottom, you've completed your task. You've either right. inserted a foley or delivered a baby or cleaned a wound or stopped bleeding, you know, but all these things are in here. So nice. it, it very much organizes, you know, what you're going to do. Um. So anyway, that would be the first thing. So before you even buy medical supplies, get a book if you want our book. Great. If you want something else, that's fine. Just get a book so you can then organize yourself. Because you just start buying stuff and that's not helpful because you might not cover an issue that was really important that you completely forgot about. Like Like dental. people Or dental or people having babies, you know, that's going to happen. So if you just want to start with a basic kit, I always put gloves, masks, hand sanitizer. Um, You want to grab some instruments. So things like scissors, tweezers, um, so different kinds of clamps. Long clamps, skinny clamps, clamps with teeth, clamps that are smooth, uh, stethoscope, blood pressure cuff. Um, You want some lighting. Headlamps are great. Make sure you have always extra batteries or way to charge it. Flashlights, because things happen, you know, 12 hours of nighttime and 12 hours a day. Um, Headlamp. Yeah, headlamps, yeah, the headlamps, flashlights, uh, reflex hammer. There's lots of instruments. Um, think of when we're talking about orthopedic um, ice packs. You're going to need to get those instant ice packs. Um, if you have, if it happens to be winter, make sure you get those ice bags. You can do those blue ones with the screw top. We've all seen yep. forever. The heat bags, you know, the the hot water bags, the red ones, because it'll be easy to heat water. It's not going to be so easy to cool, cool water, but you want to be able to do both for orthopedic. Ace wraps, SAM splints, those moldable, pliable um, splints. I happen to have one right here. These yep. are great. You can fold them up. You can use these on arms by folding it up and making them smaller. Um, they also make a neck collar. They're, they're really good for a lot of things. Um, So Sam Spence, moleskin for blisters, mylar blankets for keeping people warm, bleeding. So you want your hemostatic gauze to stop bleeding. You want different kinds of tourniquets, different sizes. Even the stretchy ones are good for little kids and really big people. Gauze, gauze, gauze. I think we talked about gauze a little bit. Sterile and non-sterile, different shapes, sizes, Um, tons of Band-Aids, again, different shapes and sizes. Uh, you want tapes to hold these gauzes on, adhesive paper, duct tape even. Um, you can get the um, Coban. It's also called Coflex, mm-hmm. which has a sticky side. Those are great for holding gauze on because then you don't have to put tape on the person. Older people have very thin skin and, and tape after a while can even start pulling yep. skin or or even hair off somebody who's hairy. So Coflex, Coban can hold on gauze. Um, very nicely and even be reused if it's not um, didn't get dirty burns think of things like non-stick gauze aloe if you can get an aloe plant that's beautiful honey never goes bad raw unprocessed honey 
will last till the end of the earth and beautiful treatment for burns Mm. soothing someone's got blisters the blisters pop um even like the most severe burns i mean things that people might not survive um in grid down situations because they need burn units after a certain percentage of burn um you know your raw honey may be your only hope to prevent infection in those burns and help with the healing it's a beautiful consistency for healing bad burns Uh, different meds uh, you talked about some of them already benadryl tylenol your ibuprofen um, aspirin's great don't give it to kids nobody under the age of 19 Um, antibiotic creams but again you can replace antibiotic creams with raw honey so basically any boo-boo any cut any chink in the skin whatsoever clean it really well put raw honey on it and then cover it up it will heal beautifully and it's unlikely to get infected do you, do you um, have to change the honey out ever ever because i so, or do you just no, let it just, just let, let it, it sit there add more just add more okay. yeah it's going to get pretty runny because our our body heat's going to make it runnier mm-hmm. um and it may leak out so just keep filling it up. Just keep putting more raw honey in it as much as you can while it's healing. It's a great thing to have it, but it can be messy. You just just yeah. know that. But, you know, we're, we're trying to, again, good healing and infection prevention. Um, you did talk, I think, a little bit about uh, diarrheal issues. Um, killed more people in the Civil War than gunshots. So think about that. Have some rehydration packets. Again, things that are dry are going to last a lot longer than things that are wet. So you don't want to stock really up on Gatorade liquid, but anything that's dry powdered that you can add to water would be great for dehydration. Mm -hmm. So you want to think about that. Um, There's a million other things. Again, I could get into different types of kits, but um, that's just a general thing. No, that's a really great overview. I think that that's a lot. That'll get people started in the right way. And hey, if you want more, uh, head on over to doomandbloom.net. They got everything you need. <laughs> Absolutely. I did I did make a baby delivery kit. I actually have one based on when I used to deliver babies in the hospitals. I actually have found the same kit that we used to yeah, open up for the delivery. It's exactly the same part kit. of the kit. Same kit I use from the same company. Oh wow. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah it comes in a sterile kit. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you never know. It's you know, being a medic for years, I have Foot lockers full of old band-aids, bandages, and all kinds. I have mean, blood pressure cuffs and all that. I'm never getting rid of it. And then, like, because, like you said, you can never have enough, especially if you end up, if we do end up in some sort of limited supply thing, which, like we talked about at the beginning of the show yep. Uh, yep. with COVID, you know, you were already seeing that and society hadn't buckled that much. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. There are still some supplies that are on limited um, purchasing. Still, I know. And some never came back. Like certain types of gloves and masks, they just changed manufacturers. They they couldn't even get them anymore. It's incredible. And this is the company I buy from is the biggest hospital supply company in the United States, Medline. That's who I got my stuff from. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that just shows that, that shows, you know, hey, get it while the getting's good. You know, it was, um, uh, when I left Vegas in March of 2020, I, I went up to Michigan to get out of the, yeah, I didn't want to be in Vegas with the lockdowns or anything that was coming. Yeah. And the last time I was still doing my PTSD therapy time, seeing my therapist once a week. And the last, my last meeting with her, I handed her a, a plastic bag with two N95 masks in it. And I, that, that was probably February. Nice. And she's like, and she was like, what are, what are these for? I'm like, you'll, yeah. you'll be here. You'll, you'll be hearing see. about. You'll, 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 you'll hey, find God. out soon enough. Yeah. Oh Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So with that, I go ahead and we can get ready to get out of here. I, I appreciate everything. You guys are a wonderful couple. You're great for the preparedness community. Thank you so much for um, coming on the show and you, like you do a lot of good. <laughs> we, we appreciate your having us on and we, we appreciate the service you do. First off, the service you've done. Yes. And we appreciate the service you do for We're the preparedness it. community yeah. now by putting out, helping us put out this information and, and information from all sorts of different experts. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. So um, that means a lot. So um, real quick, you want to give them, tell people where to go, get your book, get all your, you got so much going on where, where they can go find you. Uh, you know what is it, it very easy to do is doomandbloom.net. 
If you go to doomandbloom.net at the top, it has our Facebook link, our podcast link, our YouTube link, our Instagram link. Um, there's, you know, a place to get to the store. If you want to go over to the store, that is store.doomandbloom.net. But if you just remember doomandbloom.net, you can find the, all the hundreds of free articles that we put out. A lot of what's in the book is on the website for free. Yeah, we passed just, 1,500 articles. We made the book so people have it in case there is no internet, like today that AT&T was out. People <laughs> couldn't have accessed YouTube or watched our YouTube channel. Um, they couldn't have you know, read the articles if they had a medical issue. So the book is really just our way of saying, you know, if you can't get this, we want you to put this on your sh- on the shelf so you can access it 10 years from now, 20 years from now. On social if, if media, this disappears. Let me let me just say on social media, we have survival medicine groups on Facebook, on MeWe and on PrepperNet and uh, our Twitter or X uh Name is the uh, at Prepper Show. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. And the and the book is the Survival Medicine Handbook. Like I said at the beginning, I carried it with me overseas. It's a great book. You know, make sure you get the fourth edition. Yeah, uh, this, yeah, this we'll be cover. doing that. This we'll, cover that, is different. Definitely be doing that. And you can't. Everybody that's listening to this show, if you don't understand medicine, you can't have enough thorough books when something goes wrong. So oh, yeah. make sure you get it because you need that reference. There's, you know, it, it, it's like trying to fix a human car. If you don't know what right. you're doing, you're not going to get it fixed. The map, the yeah. map you know, exactly. of, of where things are and what they are, you know, to understand the basics first, you know, I wouldn't know how to fix a car, but if somebody gave me a map, you know, a, a little diagram and an instruction manual, I might be able to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, that's what you have to do, and right. and um, it's all in plain English, by the yes. way. So you, not not in doctor speak. No, no, no. no <laughs> read it at a fifth grade level. You can understand yep. everything in here. Yep. All right. Well, I appreciate you all, everybody. That is doomandboom.net. Make sure you head over there and check it out. And so, with that, um, thanks all for watching. Thank you so much for having us, Brian.